Braille displays are extremely expensive, which is problematic for visually impaired folks who wish to use their computer without text-to-speech software. So my senior design group set our sights on making an affordable and competitive display. For those not familiar, these displays output text from the computer screen in Braille, the little dots here along this line. Our preliminary research showed us that most of these existing Braille displays are using piezo actuation which was not an option for us taking into consideration our one semester time constraint. Though we did find some patents that showed that other technologies were being used too, though these were also found to be kind of clunky and out of our scope. We also found out that if you want more text on your display, or one of your braille dots breaks, you'd have to buy a whole new device. This is obviously suboptimal. We thought this to be suboptimal and set our sights on building a modular system that would allow for any number of characters to be displayed and that those braille cells could be swapped out by the user. Now with our engineering requirements, it was time for brainstorming. First, we decided on how our product should physically come together. We thought about using magnets or snaps, but ultimately decided on a sort of rail system where all of the parts would slide together and stay together using friction. We had a few ideas for the actuation of the braille dots themselves, six of which make up one letter slash character. One of our first ideas was to use little linear actuators to directly push the dots up and down, but this would take too much electrical current, and our goal was to have the device just be powered off of one USB port on the computer. Next we thought about using these super tiny micro stepper motors that we found on AliExpress in tandem with a sort of double cam solution that works similarly to a camshaft and valve in a car's engine as shown here in this little demonstration that we made. This idea was great, but unfortunately had too much electrical complexity regarding having four independent PWM lines for each motor. This would have been an electrical nightmare, especially with our microcontroller setup that we'll talk about later. Lastly, I came up with the idea for using a rack and pinion with a servo motor, drawing inspiration from a key and pin tumbler lock like you might find in your house door. For a six dotted braille cell, meaning three dots on each column, this would mean two servos are needed to display one full character, with three dots on each side, making up a column. That makes a total of eight combinations that the dots could take up. I'm not sure if this is the most intelligent profile that we chose for the quote-unquote key, but it certainly is what we came up with, and you can see it kind of does actually do the job pretty nicely. Here on the left you'll see a chart with all the variations that the braille can take up, and on the right you'll see how our assembly actually achieves this goal. For this to work, the full range of motion of the track is around 23 millimeters, so about two and a half times the actual height of the braille column. So this is the distance between the topmost dot and the bottommost dot. This constraint drove the size of our design as the servo and pinion gear would need to be able to produce that much linear movement. As you can see here, sometimes the raised profile sits between the pins used for the braille dots. You might be wondering if this causes issues. The answer is yes, yes, and then also yes. It does so since the servos, by the way, which only cost one dollar and some change from AliExpress, have some variance in between units and therefore are not the most accurate, at least angularly. Anyways, let's get back to the physical design. Time for CAD. Here's a quick rundown of the parts that we have and how they go together. The whole device is split into modules. Theoretically, you can have an unlimited number of modules. These modules connect to each other sideways and house four braille cells each. The leftmost module is the one that connects to the computer and has navigation buttons on it for functions like next line, clear, and tab. Each module contains a circuit board and connectors such that each module can communicate with its neighbor. On the far right side is an end cap which also has an electrical connector on it in order to cover up the exposed connections of the add-on module to its left, but also to tell the device how many modules and therefore how many braille cells it has connected. One braille cell here represents one character for the most part and slides into the modules from the front on these little rails. On the inside of this guy you'll find a mirrored setup. Each side has one servo, one pinion, and one rack and three metal dowel pins with a plastic dotted tip for the user to read. All these components are tied together by the custom PCB that we developed for this project. On the circuit board, we have an ESP32-S3 controlling the whole operation. This microcontroller controls the servo driver board, which in turn controls the servos. It also communicates over serial to the other modules and with the host computer. 
The circuit board simply slides into the module from the back and is covered up by the back cover. The pins that connect the servo also act as another way of keeping the braille cell in place other than just simply friction. In order to tell the host computer how many characters are on the display, the main module, the one on the left, measures the voltage across a resistor on the board. This is a simple voltage divider design wherein every board has a resistor on it, and the end cap on the right side grounds a circuit that is just made up of all of these resistors in series. The more modules that are connected, the smaller the voltage across the first resistor. The reason that this had to be done is that the serial communication between the modules is one way only, only to the right. This avoids confusion about which order they are in, left to right, and also saves pins on the connector. The communication between them simply passes on the word and takes off four characters that it displays. Let's say the message is Boiler Up Purdue, which is 16 characters, and let's say our display has 16 characters attached to it at this moment. The first module would receive all 16 characters, whereas the second module would only ever receive er up Purdue, and so on and so forth. The program running on the computer is a Python script that talks to the device over serial. It initializes and the device tells it how many characters it can display. The program then knows how many characters to send over in every message. The communication here is two-way, and the device informs the computer of its button presses over the serial as well. This is how the computer program knows when to send the next line of text. Now let's talk about how the program knows what text to send to the device. This is where it gets kind of scuffed, since we did not have access to JAWS, the most common screen reading tool, and no, it's not related to the shark. A legitimate product would have a driver for the JAWS software and work great and seamlessly, but unfortunately we had to make do with the built-in Windows accessibility tools, which on the upside makes this product free to use. The way our software works with Windows is that it just uses the built-in Windows captioning on the bottom of the screen, which displays text of whatever audio is going on. You can play the audio from the built-in Windows narrator, which unfortunately doesn't work as well as JAWS, but still does the trick. The program reads the captions using optical character recognition, parentheses OCR. Basically, it takes a screenshot and reads the text from the image and stores the text in a long string. Then every time the next line button is pressed, the next 16 or however many characters are attached is sent to the device. Of course, in Braille not every letter or number is just one character. So the program has to add these declaration characters for numbers for instance, and also punctuation ends up being uh, two characters. This is all handled on the computer side. Putting it all together, it does work as a coherent product and successfully outputs text though not without its challenges. Our cost for one device is around $300, so we can certainly say that we succeeded in making an affordable device. Unfortunately, the smallest servos readily available that did the trick that we used made it such that our gear had to be around 10 millimeters in diameter, even with their 270 degree throw. This meant that our spacing and our cells are quite large, unfortunately, significantly larger than what is currently on the market. I could see this product being viable if other servos were used, especially since these little guys were not that reliable, nor were they accurate. So in a way it's perfect that we had the foresight to have replaceable cells on our product, not only for the customer's sake, but also ours during the prototyping phase. A moment of silence for the servos that died during this process. Thank you.